Okay. We are now live. It's going to set up the live stream for Facebook. This is a one woman show, uh, Marianne. Great. Sorry? This is a one woman show. This is great. You're doing everything. <laughs> well, now after after last year's uh, discussion series, we um we've 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 gotten some good practice. Let's see if it's if it's really if it's really going to pan out. Right now, I'm having a a little issue with the uh, with the Facebook Live. So, hi everyone. Welcome. We've got some audience members arriving. We're up to 100 participants already. So. Nice, on time, everyone. Okay. Let's see. Okay, while you are waiting, we're gonna wait. We have uh, 300 res registrants. So we're going to wait for the majority of them to, um, to jump in. Uh, and in the meantime, you're welcome to fill out a fun poll that we have just to check in and see how everyone is feeling. Um, if you're excited to be here, why you joined, Right now we have, uh, <laughs> let's see, we've got, uh, I'm procrastinating away from another deadline that's, that's uh, in the lead at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, most people are here because they want to know how to share their data. So good stuff, good stuff guys. But it's not the best day of their lives, which we've got to make it that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to change that statistic by yeah. the end of this uh, by the end of this webinar. <laughs> so I'm still working out this um, this Facebook Live. There's always a, a glitch, but at least I'm not on my own here. I've had several incidents where I've had uh, some technical glitches and I've been the only one live without technical support trying to figure out <laughs> how to fix it. So this is, a, this is much better. At least you're, you're in it with me. Okay, so here we, here we go. We're just about ready. Okay. It's like we are cooking. All right, fantastic. We are live on Facebook and we are up to 130 participants. So we're, we're gonna get started now. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today from wherever you are um, joining us from. Um, we, uh, this webinar has been organized to celebrate Open Data Day. Um, this is a global event and it's an opportunity to reflect on how open access data can build resilience in agriculture and food systems. So for this year's event, the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT 
and the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture decided to come together to examine the role that this access uh, plays in building a resilient global food system that is res resilient to shocks. Um, so this current COVID-19 crisis has shown us just how important it is to have timely and reliable data. And it has highlighted the need for global collaboration in the collection, utilization and sharing of data so that we can inform agile responses to mitigate negative impacts. So today we have four esteemed panelists to talk about the potential that open data inspires, put to bed some of the myths around sharing one's data, to examine a few uh, CGIR resources that are available to enable this data sharing, and to look ahead to what is beyond just making data open. So please allow me to introduce to you uh, Andy Jarvis, the Associate Director General of the Biodiversity International and CF Alliance, and the co-founder of the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, um, Giriraj Amarnath, uh, who is a senior researcher um, for the research group uh, of water risk to development and resilience at the International Water Management Institute. Meta Devari, who is a senior research fellow at IFPRI, the module lead at the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, and also the data architect of the CGIR uh, Guardian ecosystem, which you'll hear more about later. And finally, uh, Rikin Gandhi, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Digital Green. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, the first speaker we have today is Andy Jarvis. So uh, he, uh, apart from being the uh, co-founder of the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, he's also the flagship leader on uh, the CGI research program for climate change, agriculture, and food security or more, more widely known CCAFs. Uh, he's based in Cali, Colombia. He has an extensive experience with cutting edge scientific research in developing countries um, to support the goals of alleviating poverty and protecting essential ecosystem services of importance to humanity. <laughs> so Andy. <laughs> that's enough, that's um, enough. <laughs> Torture. <laughs> now that all that's said and done, let's let's get stuck into it. Um, what I really want to talk to you about today is a huge data dump that you were part of uh, in 2005. Um, so for for those of you who don't know, WorldClim is one of the most impactful data sets in research and development, um, and it's 30, 30 years worth of of research and work, is that correct, Andy? And you just gave it away. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? All right, sure thing. And first of all, just to start, happy Open Data Day, everyone, right? So, woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, open data, it, it, like if you look at the history of science, open data, we've always been about open data. The, you know, science is an open data endeavor, right? Um, you know, you go back to, to, to the days of Darwin, even Darwin with all of his observations, you know, it wasn't necessarily beaming it out on the internet, obviously, but, but uh, it, the, the whole process of developing the theory of evolution was, was very much a consultative sharing notes and looking at data and querying and things between colleagues. It wasn't, you know, in the kind of the mass open uh, um, uh, data capacity that we have today, but, but that's, that's, that's how science works. Back in 1944, Robert King Merton um, was um, essentially in the science of sociology talking about the need for open data. Um, in 1955, get this, I'm, I'm not normally into history, but I thought this is useful just to, to, to open this up. In 1955, the, they created the World Data Center System. And in that, um, it actually talked about, um, even in 1955, that was the kind of where open data was coined. Even then they were talking about um, uh, that uh, everyone should, you know, science should share its data in machine readable formats in 1955, right? So, you know, the, this is essentially open data is the overriding paradigm we, we kind of live in to do our science. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I think for, for an organization like, like ours in the CGIR, it's, 
absolutely the, um, the, the paradigm we've got to be working in. This is part of it's mission critical. So to get to talk about my, my large data dump, uh, um, Marianne, I mean, I'll, I'll, let, me, uh, let me just stick in here for those of you who want to look at this on the chat. There's a nice, nice story we did a few years ago about it. But what we had was um, for, for 30 years, this wasn't me. I, was, I, was, I wasn't even born when this started. But Peter Jones uh, in um, what was then SIAC started collecting climate data. And uh, this was probably the most thankless task in the history of the planet. It basically, there was, in those days, he had a team of people who were just getting you know, these big long books with tables written like on text. And what they were doing is they were just putting that into machine readable formats, right? So they were just digitizing these thick, but, but kind of meteorological um, um, uh, notebooks of climate of the day around primarily Latin America. And it was 30 years of just constantly doing this to be able to say something, not about the weather, but say something about the climate in Latin America and be able to then, between having thousands of different points around the continent, be able to create a map so that we could figure out, well, what's the climate here, even if we don't have a climate station nearby. And so that was then all of these algorithms for, for interpolation. This, these were the crown jewels of, uh, of, of SIA back in uh, the early noughties, right? It's been, it had been 30 years, millions of dollars of investment to have an amazing database of climate and meteorology. This was gonna be, you know, this was used all the time by SEAT scientists to prioritize, to know what to invest in, all of these things. And, and, and what happened in the early noughties is essentially we did the dumbest thing ever and we gave it away. And um, it was, you know, it was like our, you know, clicking the button to kind of give it away was like, we we're all like kind of, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's a scary thing, right? But, but you know, um, there's the phrase sharing is caring, um, but I think, you know, in this case, sharing is career defining as well. And what we did is we, we, we shared this data set with Robert Hyman's. Robert Hyman's uh, brought other kind of groups from around the world. None of us had the whole picture, but collectively between five, six groups around the world, we could construct the ultimate data set on global climate from daily records of data from around the world. And so um, <clears throat> this gave, gave rise to WorldClim, which was put online, and suddenly anyone can just go online and download this stuff. Uh, we wrote a paper, and that paper uh, became, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, I think it's the second or first now uh, most cited research paper in the history of the CGIR. It's used by everyone from, you know, not just in, in our domain, this is used for um, in, in, in global health, in biodiversity studies, in water resources. Um, it's used in energy to look at hydroelectric power and things like that. It's used all over the shop. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it, for me, it has been truly career defining. Um, so, um, so I'm a big advocate now. Don't, don't, don't get scared. Share it. That's 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 my motto now. Thank you, Andy. Thanks so much. So I've launched a another poll um, that lists a couple of the myths of data sharing. So while our attendees uh, fill that out, I also wanted to ask you, Andy, about um, the responsibility of organizations like CGIR that are publicly funded. Um, can you comment on, on uh, any responsibility that there might be for them to also make their data open, considering that this data is publicly funded? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I like to, to lead people along, you know, in, 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 in the positive way with the, with the carrot. There's great reasons to share. But there's also sticks, right? And so there is an open access and open data uh, policy at the CGIR level that was developed in 2013. And that mandates that you have to share your data, right? And so we have a policy in place across the CGIR in the Alliance um, um, of, of SEAT and Biodiversity. We also have an internal policy as well, which basically requires you to share your data within a set amount of time, make it open, 
use platforms that are available, the best platforms that are available and, <clears throat> you know, and share. And, um, you know, I think this is absolutely mission critical for, um, for a, a, a publicly, a predominantly public funded um, network like um, um, CGIR, where, you know, the, the, we, we, for decades long, we had this kind of notion of global public goods. You know, today, the biggest global public good potentially that we have, that we sit on, is the data that we, we are generating every second of every day. And so, you know, I think it's mission critical. It's absolutely essential that all of our researchers are sharing. And, and so that's why it's great to have webinars like this to, to kind of encourage and, 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 and push for this. Um, but also we're gonna hear some of these great examples of, of, of how you can do this and then what you can achieve by doing it. So, so, um, so yeah, this is, this is the, the paradigm we have to be working in. Open data isn't some little geeky thing off on the side. This is the paradigm for science in the 21st century that we have to be absolutely adhering to. Thank you, uh, Andy. So if you take a look at the poll that we've launched, we've got uh, almost 60% have voted. And this we, we've got listed a couple of the, of the biggest myths around or the obstacles around the data sharing. So do you want to maybe comment on a couple of these? Um, at the moment, the leading uh, the leading obstacle is the lack of attribution or acknowledgement um, by the data that's that's used. So, can you comment on some of these? Oh, <laughs> You're... Um, I can. I mean, I can. Uh, I can sympathize with that. I mean, that that kind of fear, um, um, lack of attribution or acknowledgement by the data used. Yeah. I, but, but I, would, I would argue that in any single paper that you write, I challenge anybody to, to tell me that they've written an article that isn't using other people's stuff. Um, and you're citing, you're citing it in those articles. I mean, obviously it's a lack of professional ethics if you're not citing that, that data, but, but um, you know, this is the nature of science today is you're using and you're providing and, and everything that we do is doing that you know if anything that is published in the biological sciences and genetics it's using ncbi and national institute of health databases it's doing all sorts of um queries and using kind of collective knowledge generated in those databases in those those articles i i challenge anyone to tell me that they've written an article that does not in some way use other people's data um it, it, it's 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 very hard these days to do that um, because the you know the nature of science now has become much more collective. So so uh, you might get a lack of attribution, but you're getting you're getting also credit from other people's work from previously. You know, and so this is it is a collective uh, thing. And I would say net you gain more by sharing, just like in the Wilkman um, example, um, than than you lose. Mm. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions and comments coming through, so maybe we'll we'll move on to those. Um, I have a question here from Charles uh, Kulwa. Um, they ask, "Have we uh, we have seen how important this kind of data is? This kind of data, um, how accountable uh, should country? I guess should countries be that do not participate in sharing their data on global climate their global climactic data?" Ah, that's a good one. Um, I mean. I think the, the 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 narrative that I always use is, I mean, the 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 by not sharing those that are, you know, that you're, you're only doing harm to your own country. Um, because if you look at there's a number of cases of kind of countries where they've opened up their net data um, to become public access. You know, right now many met met systems. The problem is met systems are not very well funded, and so they compensate for lack of funds by selling their data and it's like a vicious cycle for me of of essentially there you're not promoting use of the data so the met system is undervalued and it doesn't get the budget that it needs and so you know you've got to break that cycle and i think there's 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 a number of great examples of countries which open up their met data make it open data and then suddenly that flourishes this whole range of users of that data and Generator, generators of services with that data that tell society, tell sectors what, how better to manage their, their, um, 
risks in front of, to, to climate change and variability and things like that, better weather forecasts, you name it, all of this. And all of that just comes back to create the net system, make it more valuable. And so that's, you know, that that's really what you've got to be got to be showing is is the economic value of making data data available. And that's one of the things we've not been very good at um, is 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 showing well what's the what's the economic impact and what's the you know the, the societal impact of sharing data. And I think there are probably some very very good statistics out there on that. And we need to do a lot more in our domain. Um, to, to show that. There's a, the, um, Arwen has put in the chat also a nice, nice one about maybe not all researchers are familiar with data papers, which in theory should help with the attribution problem. I think this, this for me is really exciting. And I, 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 I love the fact now that a lot of journals have just created a data paper so that instead of just like sticking your data on some online repository and people downloading and hoping, hoping that they cite you um, for the you know, online repository, publishing your data with an actual publication that has, you know, is an ISI index journal that gets you the attribution on that. And then to boot, you get the, the, the citations. That's, that's, a, that's a bit of a game changer. And I think that's really important. And I encourage people to do that a lot more. We should be, we should be not only publishing our data kind of on online repositories, but publishing the kind of the metadata and the description, the science behind that data into these data papers. So that's, that's a great one. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, uh, and that's a great tip about the about the data papers. So thank you, Arwen, for for uh, introducing that topic. Um, there's another question here from Rafael. Uh, they say creation of data is usually expensive and a laborious part of research. Are there any business models that allow for profiting from open open data? <laughs> it's an interest interesting question for you, Andy. Wow, that's a tough one. I mean, I open that one up. I mean, that's that's one I think that is 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 great to have a kind of you know chat about and on all the panelists. Um, business models allowing for profiting from opening the data. I mean, um, what we have done in the past is is you can use um, Creative Commons licenses that basically allow allow free use of data for non commercial purposes. But where you have to um, um, apply, essentially, you know, request for access to commercial uh, use, and you can charge for that. And so that's, you know, that's one option, one way of doing that, where basically you make it open for for non-commercial use. You 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 create a revenue stream, essentially, for any commercial use that you you know. And we've done that in some cases in the past, and you you reinvert that 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 income in making the data set better or improving it, um, continuing to share it, things like that. So, so yeah, there are, there are certainly models for that. And I think that's, that's, that's a, if, if, you know, in, in, in things like met systems, um, out there, that could be a way to, a, a way to go for example. Thanks so much, Andy. Um, so look, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to leave this poll open. Um, but uh, one of the questions uh, and one of the, the, the most highly voted uh, obstacles is something that I guess we'll go into uh, more during this webinar, and that is the lack of incentives to publish this data. And I think someone who would be great to answer this is our next speaker. Um, uh, so uh, Giri Raj, uh, as I said, he's a senior researcher at the International Water Management Institute. Um, his research focuses on developing solutions to climate risk management using advanced science and technologies in different hydroclimate regions. He leads a research program on water risks to development and resilience that aims to strengthen agricultural disaster risk management in South Asia, African countries, namely index-based flood insurance, bundled insurance solutions with seeds and climate information services, drought monitoring and early warning in addressing food and security that can help smallholder farmers adapt to climate change. He's also the recent winner of the World Geospatial Excellence Award for the work on the South Asia drought monitoring system to mitigate uh, drought risks. So uh, welcome Giriraj. Um, he has a really exciting project to talk about um, and specifically what uh, him and his team were able to do with data that was made open and accessible. So um, please, Giriraj, uh, we'd be happy for you to take the floor now. 
thank you thank you so much for uh, introducing and uh, andy uh, gave really a, a excellent uh, background and um, uh, the chat message and uh, it was very interesting i also want to give two observation prior to my presentation um, way back when i was doing my phd in uh, um, in somewhere in 1999 where we need to access satellite data from nasa or the us geological survey where a single satellite uh, data cost you about 250 dollar and uh, and if you are uh, talking about a large geographical region it was not possible in the year of 2000 and then the US Congress passed a bill to ensure that the US geological survey data becomes open access for anyone to use and access in research or for private agency. And that particular time they estimated the uh, economic benefit is over 30 billion US dollar in the year of uh, 2000. And it is not just about satellite data cost of uh, earning to the US government of 30 billion it brings a co-benefit and co-business uh, model because if the person is going to use satellite data, he or she is going to use uh, robust computers, internet, uh, the communication satellite, a lot of uh, synergies are going to emerge from the open access principle. So I would say that uh, there is a lot of studies going on, including the uh, great work coming from Copernicus uh, program where you make ensure that all the satellite become open access. So in, in coming to this journey to open data day, I see there is a lot of uh, development is happening around this field of open access, making a lot of uh, commercial and viable business models are getting developed. And unlike any other product, you don't have any expiry for this data. So if you take any medicine or anything, you have expiry. But here, uh, if Andy produced a world claim data 15 years before, but still people are using it. So I believe that uh, making this research, making the accessible data is a very important potential for uh, researchers and also to understand the problems in climate risk. Uh, with that, I just want to highlight a couple of slides here. Uh, one of that is, uh, is a screenshot I received here. How do we really uh, open up this uh, open data where we are talking about it brings a lot of positive things, uh, making sure uh, the transparency in the data accessible and available to all and it's making digital and they are machine readable we don't want uh, to be like a piled up of papers of where you can see the data every time but how do you make it the data reusable interoperability as well and also to make sure that it does not come with a lot of restriction for use and a lot of still challenges on redistribution of the data which is again a challenges some of the areas we are still working out and I just want to begin this particular picture of where the open data characteristics will help us to um, move forward and what I thought in the next couple of uh, slides I will run through some use case specifically how uh, international water management have uh, come across with open access data here and uh, like Andy was mentioning who is using uh, others data set. So this is an example of uh, Aquadac uh, uh, from the World Resource Institute, which produced a global uh, risk information from hazard to water availability to all sort of information. And when you uh, combine uh, biophysical to scenario models, you could end up producing a product like what I'm showing here, where it gives you a broader picture of message, how much of people are having poor water quality. Right. So you use groundwater data, uh, you use a seasonal variability in water, understanding the drought risk or flood, you could be able to quantify at a, a administrative unit, what's the kind of a, a poor water quality. This will help the uh, policies in the region in improving better water supply, drinking uh, to the community so that it help us to look at hunger and some of the SDG indicators. So. This is a very classical example WRI has done. And again, um, there are few countries which makes uh, open access. One of that is Netherlands as a very good principle. When you have any software or data developed four to five years by law, they are supposed to make all the data publicly available. So it's always good to see country like Netherlands makes this uh, product uh, easily available to any user to use it for research or for any application. The second one is uh, we were in the mid of pandemic uh, during COVID-19. 
where we were uh, thinking about how do we go to our farm field to know whether the farmers are affected by uh, flood insurance. And that's the time we saw a massive cyclone and also uh, travel restriction for even for rural farmers could not go out due to the spread of uh, COVID. And uh, we put together uh, um, a lot of open access data coming from the Google Earth Engine. And we used a lot of uh, machine learning models to prepare uh, on which week likely we can say the farmers are uh, will be harvesting. And this data was produced for globally. Uh, and we have an app available in our website and people can access and download the data as well. And this made uh, really good for us to reach out to policymakers to explain them uh, what's the relevance of uh, Earth observation data to provide some of the answers to, uh, to the time where there is a lot of challenges in the field level. And, uh, and moving on to that, I just want to show here, it's also again, uh, the satellite data is a very good indicator for people to read and build the trust around the information. Like uh, you can see in a two weeks time, the farmers were completely harvested the entire Indo-Gangetic plain, the wheat crops or a rice crop. So it, it clearly shows when you go to the policymaker, you need to convince a case not by uh, a very limited ground data, a large scale mapping satellite may be a good indicator for us to help. And uh, particularly it was a very good for us to present during the time of pandemic, how these footprints are very, satellite footprints are very useful for us. And again, uh, we were providing certain guiding materials, what they should do in terms of uh, during the a colliding co-disaster where pandemic is there and also the cyclone and the floods are happening. So we were preparing a lot of uh, a guideline document how this will be useful to the end user. And moving to that, uh, we were uh, quite some time working on a drought surveillance system, which is again built on a lot of open access data from temperature to soil moisture to understanding how much water is evaporating and how much water is uh, going below the surface and we looked at all this information, developed a model again using a Python-based model. And what is more important is uh, on the top-down approach, you get a lot of wonderful spatial map, but how does it make relevance to the field level? So we connect and work with the local communities on the importance of developing a knowledge product, which they feel it is useful and they can make certain decision out of it. So we have been working and educating farmers as well, the importance of uh, locally developed um, knowledge information and then how do you plug in with your uh, space technology data and then you put together this information in a dashboard of course it's not available in a local language but the important is anyone can log in and access what's the crop management practices they do they should do in the order of what the likely drought is going to come so it's a lot more a uh, lot of open access technologies were used but the important is the usefulness of making sure this data is used by farmers or even by the extension department and to the policymakers what they can do and le learn the lesson from a drought even that happens in a given year, right? And uh, we won this geospatial award for this drought surveillance system, uh, which has been uh, implemented since 2015 onwards from the time where we have this open. And then we move on to the next generation of uh, technologies, which is coming is the cloud framework where you don't need to do much processing, accessing the data in your local computers. Now today we have a lot of uh, cloud services are coming up through Amazon or through Google. What you do is scientifically developed algorithms you put on in uh, public domain, or you come with certain restriction and you use their data sets and produce a map. And today you, you can get the product in uh, two seconds to three seconds, uh, machine learning based drought early warning systems that you can develop. And this is just a prototype I'm showing it, which we were implemented in uh, Afghanistan. And again, here, the importance is uh, when you develop any product that limits to a specific department. Here we have opened up to a, a institutional framework of uh, 10 departments who is accessing the data because uh, each agencies have their own uh, characteristics of what they are supposed to do. A agency of med department interested to know metrological drought, not much interested on the cropping condition and what they are supposed to do. So you look at uh, feeding the system, providing the knowledge product for different users from uh, type of users I just mentioned here. And I just want to also highlight the last two slide is again, we have been working with the uh, 
CCAF and uh, other uh, research program of uh, water, land, and ecosystem, where we were uh, uh, looking at the challenges of what communities could not able to transfer the risk whenever there is a periodic floods happen. So we work with uh, private sector, including insurance companies, where we reached out and explained the consistency and the quality of uh, satellite data that can help you to design an index insurance product. And what we uh, see here as an index-based flood insurance, and we were able to successfully scale over a, a 15,000 household, and now it has been scaled out to a lot more countries in uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, elsewhere. And again, uh, how does open access earth observation data is fundamentally useful for climate action, uh, promoting the usefulness of adaptation programs, what the countries are expected to do, and in terms of the sustainability of the livelihood. So this is again a, another prototype I'm just highlighting. With that, I just want to uh, end up by saying here, uh, the world has opened up a lot of uh, satellite observation, uh, the uh, geosynchronizing satellites, whether it's a communication satellite, whether you have collection to Facebook data or the data coming from the citizen science data where you do with IoT, a lot of things are coming up. One of the uh, bigger initiative have come through the Open Data Cube and also the cooperation coming from the Digital Earth Africa, where we are implementing a water secure Africa initiative. Uh, we are uh, expecting to do in the coming two years uh, what we define as a readiness application product where the user need not to even do a lot more backend system. So we believe in the coming years, uh, these Open Data Cube becomes knowledge hub for a lot more end users. And then this will also translate that open data for a resilience initiative. Again, this is an initiative developed by GFDRR, part of the World Bank. And again, you are if you have a good data bank and the data services you have developed, you are free to reach out to this initiative and you can post your data freely. And the researchers or any user can download and uh, reuse the information. So with that, I stop here. And uh, thank you for giving this opportunity uh, from the CGR Big Data Platform. Thank you. Uh, Giridaj, thank you so much. Um, there's so many comments and questions that, that I have, and there's many coming in in the chat as well. Um, I think, first of all, I would love to, to, to hear more about the direct impact uh, during times of, of this pandemic when, um, you know, we're talking about insurance. Did this, how did this help inform uh, insurance companies? Did this speed up the process? What was that direct impact there for farmers? So uh, yes, I, I think this is a very good question. Uh, I can speak of the example of Bangladesh uh, where we are stuck in Colombo and the uh, insurance company uh, sitting in Dhaka also not able to go to the field. So what we uh, established is an uh, open data kit where you uh, use your mobile app to take a pictures of where the flood is there. And uh, from the satellite data, you could capture the severity of the flood information when you correlate, you get a reasonable accuracy of what's happening in the field. And then you uh, uh, pass this information to the insurance company to say, what's the likely uh, claim and the payout will be there. And again, the insurance company is not able to reach out to the uh, county where they are going to go and do the payout. So they, uh, Bangladesh is excellent in uh, mobile bank transfer and they were able to do the payout directly to their uh, mobile banks. So. You can see here uh, when the pandemic opens up a lot of problem, it also brings a lot of opportunity where the farmers are able to take the uh, field pictures and posting the data where it comes with the reliable GPS points. So it's not no one could tamper the data of uh, saying uh, everywhere there is a flood. So that's where again the uh, satellite data will also able to help us whether these locations are right or wrong. So it was a good exercise for us to uh, work and again, uh, for farmers, it is a, a very good uh, tool as well, because uh, in some places where the insurance payout doesn't happen well, where they can go as a proofing as well in the future years to come. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, the other the other point I, I, I thought was really interesting was um, first of all, about the combined data. So you were uh, using open data from Google uh, from Google Earth and and then combining that with like so locally sourced data. Um, and and then you also spoke about the cloud capabilities now. Does this sort of speak to um, a kind of a golden age of the potential that's around sharing data that you know it can sort of go a lot further 
there's i i think uh, this is unstoppable now uh, because um, there are a lot of projects coming from uh, uh, multi million dollar projects are happening now where we expect the farmers is going to collect the data now in future so the more they collect and the more the satellites are going to get access you become more uh, audited by this uh, so called what's happening in the ground and the more the data you have the models are going to be well trained and that's where the cloud based infrastructure is going to help but again this comes with certain degree of cost uh, because when you use a cloud infrastructure usually no uh, private sector are going to give us free but maybe at the beginning point you might get certain free services but i would say still it is reliable and cheaper as well instead of you uh, host a series of human resources hiring a database expert hiring a modeler uh, hiring a fellow to do a image processing some of the things you can get rid of that and focus more on the data analytical aspects so how do you interpret the data how do you provide meaningful applications to the farmers or to the end user so i think we are going into the golden uh, stage of uh, uh, reusing and uh, producing new products and uh, i think with one cgr reforms are going on i think we will be uh, in a better position and equally the big companies like microsoft and others are stepping in uh, to bring more uh, more lot more, lot more things to happen in the uh, coming years i would say Thank you, thank you, Giraj. Um, I'm going to to grab a couple of questions here from the audience. Um, one that I, I think is is great is this work transferable to other to other continents? Yes, uh, given the satellite data are uh, uniform and the structures of uh, uh, collection and processings are uniform, uh, I would say that it's quite transferable. But it comes with certain degree of validation, uh, consultation with the partners to define. Uh, the thresholds and uh, interpretation and the use demand based product we should develop so i i would certainly say it's scalable but comes with certain uh, customization okay i thank you so much i have an, another question here from federic he's a student from uh, east eastc um i'm not sure i, I i'm going to try to to articulate this, please, if uh, I'm understanding wrong, uh, Frederick, you feel free to to re-enter the question. But I think that he he's referring to um, digitalization platforms and whether certain countries have that infrastructure to be able to share the data. Like what like what is the mechanism for for them to make their their data public using a digitalization process? Is that does that do you understand what that what that means? <laughs> yeah, I, I could uh, understand. Hopefully, I will respond to that. So, so uh, the uh, challenges was that on uh, on in the early phase of that, people made sure that the satellite agencies provide freely available satellite data. But if you look at any form of the data where the satellite uh, agencies produce, they are comes with few gigabytes of data. And in a uh, where in a region where there is no connectivity and better 5G or 4G is not there, uh, the uh, the communities are not able to use these data sets. Now this is where this open data cube is coming into the process where you don't need to access uh, any of your the raw data. Here you are going to receive a, a readiness product. Readiness products means you understand the leaf area index. You understand how the uh, sediment loads are there in the river system. So you get whatever the user defined product, but you might need to invest in the knowledge of developing those scientific algorithm. Once that is done, you need to have a basic computers and even a laptop is good enough for you to access and produce a lot of applications. So I think that's where uh, the new form of uh, data development is going on. Thank you so much. Um, so I've, I've got another question here about farmers ac accessing the data from from Ralph, um, but I, I think uh, I think this is more about not necessarily about giving the data raw data to the farmers, but I I, I would say it's more about informing um, tools and policy that then helps farmers. Yeah. Is that this correct? So I think in always in data there should be uh, different users. So you, when we produce this technical information to uh, directly to the farmers. I don't think it makes really an uh, decision making information for the farmers. So speaking of weather forecast data, where you don't need to really explain them what's the rainfall or what's the temperature, but if you translate that information with a 
agronomic advisory, what's the likely pest diseases are going to be there. And for that, we need to understand what the requirements are, and then you translate that uh, agronomic practices or a kind of uh, floods or drought is going to happen. And then you come with more remedial measures. So it's not just uh, displaying the data or presenting what's the crunchy numbers you are trying to present to them, but rather you reach out to them with more application oriented knowledge. Then I believe the farmers are more happy to uh, utilize the science-based information rather than just a technical data here. So uh, farmers needs a si simple information, but it more reliable and accurate in the long run that we should ensure that. Thank you so much, uh, Giriraj. We will open up uh, for Q&A at the end of the, of the session. Um, so thank you so much for talking about some of the incentives and some of the potential impacts of open data. Uh, we're going to move now on to the next panelist because we want to to introduce um, a to the topic of what is sort of beyond open data. What happens when you have uh, all the data open, um, and is that really is that really enough? So um, our next panelist, uh, Mita Devari. Uh, so Dr. Devari, she is a senior re senior research fellow. Sorry. <laughs> um, at the International Food Policy Research um, uh, Institute, or IFPRI, as you may know. Um, she received her PhD from Cornell in crop and soil sciences and has worked as an agronomist for CBIR for many years now. Um, she previously led a project in Nepal to improve productive, productivity and profitability in farming systems, working closely with farmers to implement sustainable management, uh, data management practices. Uh, she is one of the key architects, or the, the data architect for the CBIR platform uh, for big data and agriculture and the platform's module one lead. Um, she's also the author and architect of the Guardian Ecosystem, CGIR's flagship data harvester, which enables the discovery of publications and data sets from across all CGIR centers and beyond. Um, so Meta, last year we, uh, we we, we published an article interviewing you um, talking about how when it comes to big data, um, fair data is the new open data. And you said that um, to harness the potential big data technologies, our data assets must be easily transferable, downloadable, interpretable, and actionable as humans as well by humans as well as machines. So data must not only be open, but it must also be fair. So I would love it if you want to go into more detail about that. Great, thanks, Marianne. Um, can you see my screen? Hopefully you can, um, but I can't seem to get rid of this Docker thing, so. Okay, um, so hopefully you can hear me and see the slides. I wanna run through a couple of slides really quickly. So Marianne talked a little bit about uh, FAIR data. What is FAIR? It's, it's data that's, or data assets really, any kind of data asset that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so why is this important? Well, because um, even if data is open, it's not necessarily, uh, uh, interpretable, neither by humans nor by machines, especially not by machines. Um, and so we need to we need to sort of focus on on a on a landscape that's kind of inclusive of, of open but but takes uh, a few steps beyond that. Um, part of the motivation for this is that researchers are spending 80% or more of their time finding and organizing data. And this is a statistic from sort of the biomedical domain. But uh, and it's probably much likely to be more for for uh, our domain where data is not born uh, digital typically. Um, so the bottom line is that fair data can reduce time. Uh, and what does that entail? It usually means that you're focusing on semantic interoperability, enabling semantic interoperability, which means using standard metadata, ontologies, uh, and controlled vocabularies. So how does CGIR support all of this? Um, CGIR now has, uh, or, or will soon have, um, 
a, a policy uh, that's that's sort of beyond the open access and data management policy of 2013. This policy makes very explicit uh, what FAIR is, what the expectations are in terms of FAINR, um, and how you know how the the uh, the the organization can move together, move much more towards this, including some of the issues that came up earlier in the discussion. Uh, such as incentivizing, uh, you know, uh, resourcing adequately, et cetera. It tries to lay out all of the, the framework for that. So this should be um, getting out there and, and, and hopefully ratified uh, pretty soon. We're not there yet, but we will be. Marianne mentioned uh, the Guardian data ecosystem. Um, and so I'm just gonna touch quickly on this. Are there resources to help verify my data? That's probably one of the first questions you'll ask when you're, when you're uh, you know, thrown this policy. Um, and so the, the answer is yes. Um, I can't actually see the, the screen here, but, but I pointed an arrow to this data management toolkit that's um, at, the, at the, uh, the heart of, of the Guardian homepage. Uh, so you'll see the number of publications we have, the number of data sets we have. And I should mention, these are not just from CGIR. They're from all of the 30 odd repositories across the 15 CGIR centers. Uh, but also our key partners, such as uh, USAID, uh, the, the, the UK's Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, USAID, uh, USDA, um, the Indian government's open data portal, whatever data we can get at uh, for agriculture, um, the World Bank, etc. So we're trying to bring all this and create a knowledge base that people can, anybody, anyone, whether you're CGI or not, can get into and get at. The other thing I want to also point out here, apart from that data management toolkit that you should definitely check out, where there are a number of tools that could be of help, help to you, um, is that we have a secure uh, uh, data repository available. So if you're not part of CGI or if you belong to any organization uh, that doesn't have their own repository, doesn't have their own workflows to get data, uh, into the public domain, you can use this. Um, so that that's that's something that's that's something to be aware of. Contact me if you have questions on any of this, of course. Um, you may say, okay, fine, you're telling me I, I need to make my data fair. How the heck do I do this? There's a number of resources available to this. And, and I mentioned metadata and ontologies. These are the sort of key, uh, pieces of enabling uh, uh, fairness of, of data. And we have a metadata schema that's been developed across CGIR. Uh, Alliance folks were key uh, in that, as well as a number of ontologies, again, working with Alliance uh, people, as well as uh, beyond that, including partners like FAO. Um, so, so we have those resources, but they're not, I, I recognize they're not easy to, to sort of dive into and start using. You don't necessarily know what an ontology is, nor do you maybe want to. Um, what we're trying to do is to make that very, very easily actionable. So we have a verification workflow. Again, that's available through the Guardian Data Management Toolkit. Go there. Um, and check it out. This, this is going to be made much more user-friendly uh, by about April or so. Right now, I admit it's there, but it's not terribly user-friendly. So we can help you with it, uh, but, but there will be a much more friendlier version uh, available very soon to that. So, you know, what you, you may even step back a little bit more and say, right, you know, fair data, it sounds great, but, but I don't really understand what it means or what it takes to get to making data more findable, more accessible, and so on. So um, we, we have a resource, uh, again, available through Guardian that, that sort of is a guideline towards make, you know, to making data more fair. And, and this kind of steps you through um, moving from a sort of a score of zero to a score of five um, to, to, to each of these FAINR. Um, Guardian itself uh, enriches the native metadata that comes with it to enhance fairness. Um, and so it does things like uh, adds ontology and controlled vocabulary terms to your to the keywords that you've input um, when you've entered this, da this data asset, whatever it might be, publication or data. Um, the, the author fields are, 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 are also enhanced um, and checked. And of course, there's a fair score with every resource that you find in Guardian. Now, again, if you're from, you know, your repository, you don't have a repository or you want us, you know, or you want uh, to upload your data into Guardian, you can do that and your data will show up in the same way, uh, along with machine readable, uh, wherever possible licenses available. 
So we're slowly taking steps towards making uh, data fair. Uh, but you may say, right, well, this sounds great, but I actually want to, to generate data born fair. So we've got tools to help you do that. Uh, also part of that toolkit. Um, but the, the, I just want to point out this is right now present for agronomy, for agronomists to use the agronomy field information management system, and you can check that out. Um, the last thing I want to uh, point out is, is a, a work that's been done by uh, Camila Bonilla, um, uh, Jordan Chamberlain and Robert Haymans, who, who, who Andy mentioned earlier, what they did was to dive into Guardian and to, and to look for data to answer a broad question of uh, is fertilizer use profitable and where is it profitable across a number of uh, locations in, in Africa. And so they were able to find, I think, over 120 or so data sets in Guardian, uh, develop machine learning models, uh, combine, you know, with, combined with other sorts of data, be able to sort of finally get to uh, an assessment of where data is actually, uh, where, where fertilizer is actually profitable uh, in a number of uh, African nations. So that's kind of a, a real use of, of findable and accessible data, but I will mention that uh, they had tremendous trouble with the interoperability. They had to, to work quite a lot to, to get to where they could actually finally um, manipulate the data to, 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 to do this analysis. So, so I just want to pop that out as a, as a sort of a, an example of what you can enable when you have data that's findable and ac accessible and ideally uh, also interoperable. Um, so with that, I'll stop. I, I, I wanted to keep this pretty quick and give you a quick overview of the kind of depth of tools or the breadth of tools that we that we have available. And I encourage you to go uh, and check that out. Meta, thank you so much. Um, I've just popped in a couple links into the chat. Um, one of them is a link to the uh, information data management community of practice that uh, Meta also leads. And there's some fantastic resources there on how to make your data fair. Um, links to Guardian, to AgroFIMS, and some of the other tools that, that uh, Meta mentioned in her in her chat. So if you have any questions for Meta, please uh, pop them into the Q&A function. Um, Meta, for me, I'd, I'd love to, to ask a little bit also about, um, about how well, during this pandemic, um, uh, it, it's taught us that data from one organization is, is not enough uh, when it comes to adapting to uh, in, during crisis like, like this. So how have these fair data principles enabled the CGIR and Guardian as well to break out of those uh, silos and start combining CGIR open data with other data sets from other organizations. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so, so what we're trying to do, as I mentioned, uh, is, is in Gu Guardian represents a knowledge base that's much bigger than CGIR and it keeps growing. Every year we have more data. We're hoping to have uh, one acre fund data available this year, for instance, as well as another, uh, you know, a lot of other key data sets. Um, all of that data is, is treated the same way as it, it makes its way into Guardian. And so, you know, the, 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 the uh, algorithms that allow metadata enrichment, that allow, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the license to the extent possible to be converted into a machine readable license, um, that all sort of creates a, a level playing field and allows people to, to interact with the data in the same way. It doesn't mean that, of course, all of that data is interoperable. Um, much of it is not, in fact. And so we're, you know, that's the, sort of the next step towards the holy grail of being able to uh, do what you're talking about and, and, and do what, uh, you know, uh, uh, teams like the one I just talked about with that Africa uh, profitability use case have done. They use data primarily from CGIR. Uh, but, but, you know, if, if you're looking at, um, uh, input output data prices and things like that you're going to need other data sets as well so so i think that's where uh the power of being able to first of all find and access data uh but but ideally you know get to where you can actually quickly do something with that data is 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 very useful Thank you, Meta. I've got a question here from Robert. Um, they ask, what is the major difference um, that Guardian offers uh, uh, compared to other data repositories like, De like Dataverse? Um, and then another question is, how do you ensure a data quality? Right. 
Um, so the, the, the data that's in Guardian or that's discoverable through Guardian, I should mention that what Guardian does is harvest metadata. It doesn't take data and, and you know, bring it into some other place. Um, so this data is coming from repositories. Many of those repositories are actually Dataverse platforms. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Robert. I mean, I, I, um, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is the data sits where it sits. We make it discoverable. But you know, if you want, if you don't have a repository, if you don't have the resources to maintain uh, things like that, now you could try using the Dataverse. There is a Dataverse that sits sort of, if you will, behind Guardian as yet another repository that Guardian will look over. So if your data is in there, it will also be visible in the same way. Um, so, so Guardian itself is not a repository, it's a metadata harvester that is harvesting from a number of repositories, many of which are Dataverse. So effectively, what uh, Guardian does is it helps to make that data that's open, that's been shared, it, it helps to make it usable and accessible and to get to, to those who can really, uh, really use it. And actionable, because we and also actionable. are building, we're building pipelines, you know, we've, we've sort of not stopped here and said, yay, we've made the data findable and accessible, great. I mean, we have all these tools to make it more um, interoperable, but we're also providing uh, sort of, we're thinking about the so what? Now we have the data, we want to be able to build the pipelines um, to, to, to make that data actionable. So we have something called CG Labs, that's also part of that uh, toolkit that you can check out, which is a collaborative research environment that many of the Alliance researchers actually have benefited from using. Um, so, you know, and there we're also trying to build uh, uh, the ability to not only to analyze your data we're using R and Python with preloaded uh, libraries um, of algorithms, but also crop models increasingly. So you can do, you know, getting towards much more of that NCBI like click and play. And I, you know, I, I, I was working as a bioinformatician at Cornell. So um, getting to that sort of holy grail where you can get from data to insight relatively quickly is really where we want to be, but we're not, you know, we're making baby steps. We're not there yet. Thank you so much, Meta. Um, we're going to close uh, with the last presenter. Um, I'm really excited uh, to finish with with this particular presentation because, um, and we we've heard about uh, why open data is important. Um, you know, what are some of the incentives? What what's the potential impact? Um, how to make your data open? How to make it fair so it's it's more easy to be used and 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 actionable? Um, but one thing that's become very clear um, during this this pandemic is is that it's not just about uh, you know singular actions it's you know we really need a uh, global collective effort when it comes to data sharing and collaborating on on uh, complex problems so that we can build a more resilient uh, food system that that you know can respond and adapt well when we have shocks like 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 this recent uh, pandemic so um let me introduce uh Rikin Rikin Gandhi he's the co-founder of Digital Green, um, which is a global development organization that empowers smallholder farmers to lift themselves out of poverty by harnessing the collective power of digital technology and grassroots level partnerships. Um, Rickon began his career at Oracle, where he received patents for linguistic search algorithms that he helped develop. Later, he joined Microsoft's research technology for emerging markets team in India, where he researched ways to amplify the effectiveness of agricultural development globally. Digital Green uses peer-to-peer uh, -peer farming videos to increase the efficiency of agricultural extension services and a shared logistics to market service to boost services to boost farmer incomes. Digital Green is now building FarmStack as an open platform uh, to enable 2 million smallholder farmers across Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia that it has already worked with to control and share their own data uh, with the support from the Mil Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, DFID, uh, Walmart Foundation and others. Um, this is uh, so interesting, Rikin, about uh, this integral part of Digital Green, how, how much you emphasize partnerships. And I would really love to hear about, in particular, this uh, project CropWatch um, that Digital Green was a part of, um, and to hear more about the partners that were involved in this and how and, and what sort of role sharing the, the sharing of data played in, in, in the success of this project. 
Well, thank you so much for having me and uh, welcome everyone again for Open Data Day. It's great to celebrate the day with all of you and, and to follow the, the previous speakers. Uh, so as was shared, our work at Digital Green is, is really at the grassroots in partnership with various public extension systems in places uh, of like India with the Ministry of Rural Development or in Ethiopia with the Ministry of Agriculture where we work with about 2 million odd farmers who are involved in agricultural extension programs of the type that you're seeing here on the page uh, where videos by and for farmers are being shown uh, by a local extension agent to a group of farmers offline, but where data is being collected about what individual farmers uh, were, what were exposed to in what particular location at, at what particular time. And this data is collected for each individual farmer as they watch uh, each video every two weeks in sync with the cropping season. Similarly, after each video screening, data is collected by our extension system partners, uh, for instance, development agents in Ethiopia, where after the video screenings, they go to farmers' fields and see which of these practices that these farmers were exposed to did they actually adopt. And that data is recorded into a shared MIS uh, and records information about what seed variety or sow date or irrigation, intercrop, fertilizer, weeding operation, these individual farmers uh, actually applied on their fields. And, and how did that change over time? Did they apply more of these practices? Did they drop them from one season to the next? And as you can imagine, we use this data with our government partners uh, to inform the production and distribution of new content based on frequently asked questions or practices that farmers are or are not adopting. And it's actually available also online where uh, a re repository of more than 6,000 6, videos in 50 languages is organized using this data, right? So that you can see which of these, which of these programs is more effective or less effective um, and be able to sort it. Uh, based on various types of crop, seasonality, language, and, and other such parameters. Now, of course, this though is used only mainly for digital green and for our uh, extension system partners. Uh, and th that is useful, obviously, to target programs with, with uh, the farming communities that we work with and to strengthen our partners' operations. But as we've been talking about today, there's obviously a real opportunity to think of this digital or data glue as not just being stuck within our own individual silos, but to really see how can the same data, for instance, enable these farmers to go beyond uh, the stack of interventions that we're involved in, but to connect with other third parties who might use this very same data for traceability purposes, if I'm a, a buyer of, of farmer produce, or with policymakers or researchers uh, who might be able to also inform their own agendas uh, based on uh, these types of data trends. And that's what we did with the CropWatch uh, program was to uh, share the data that we had collected historically of these farmers' plot perimeter locations, yield data, and also some of these agronomic practices. And this was all done pre-COVID-19. And then once uh, the pandemic hit, a lot of these uh, field operations had to be cur curtailed. Uh, but just as Giriraj shared, this data was able to be used by the CGIR Big Data and Agriculture team, uh, along with their crop models, uh, to then make estimations on what kind of changes in crop production uh, farmers were uh, making uh, as the pandemic hit. And that informs not just Digital Green and our extension system partners, but again, actually, uh, informs the wider ecosystem. And in fact, a number of organizations, as Meda mentioned, are part of this, uh, including Digital Green, but also One Acre Fund for, for some of the data that they've collected in East Africa, Plantix uh, as well. And uh, this data is available on a CGIR website called CropWatch. Um, and I'd encourage you to check it out. I think the East Africa uh, data is, is live at the moment and the South Asia uh, one is coming soon. Uh, but this is the power of, of sharing data so that we can achieve these win-win type of objectives, both to inform our own programming, uh, but also 
uh, for the larger ecosystem in which we all work. And uh, to conclude, you know, that's really what we've seen with the value of open data uh, in and of itself. Uh, it has limited value, but when it is combined with organizations and individuals who have uh, uh, strong intentions and competency and have done a lot of the formative foundational work on, on investments, whether that's on physical infrastructure or human capital or policy or finance, data uh, can really help to connect the dots uh, across our respective interventions and maximize uh, our collective impact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rikin. Um, that's really great. And, and you know, I would love to also hear a little bit about, um, how, I mean, for this CropWatch project, you had uh, different partners with different types of data that they shared. Why was this particular partnership unique? Is it, is it because of the different types of data? Is it the, the puzzling of the pieces together? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was unique in that uh, it, it happened before the pandemic, but it was it was really uh, cr critical during the pandemic because we had collected some of this data in the field of crop perimeter, uh, plot perimeters together with some of this yield data and some of these ancillary agronomic information as well. And But we were then in the dark about knowing what, what is happening for these farmers. How should we together with our extension partners prioritize certain types of uh, practices that we might be able to share with these communities uh, through remote means like WhatsApp channels and such. Um, but with this partnership, uh, we were able to get some of that insight um, as, as even some of these limitations started to take place in the field. And, and that's what I think is the opportunity, right? Sometimes research might have more of the remote sense data and they want the ground truth, truth information, just as Giri Raj mentioned, or it could be vice versa, right? That we have the ground truth information and we want to like uh, validate the remote sense based models. Uh, but, but being able to have multiple ways uh, to be able to understand what's taking place to inform extension, research, um, and even farmers' own decision-making is, is what I believe is critical. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with, the, with the digital, this digital agricultural revolution, uh, one uh, challenge that uh, keeps coming up is, is inclusivity and accurate representation. And, um, I, you know, I would love to hear you comment on, on, on this, how is opening data up, is that, is that another way that this can help um, bring together data from, for example, from on the ground data that can better represent um, locals. Can you make any comments on that? Yeah, there's obviously huge uh, data holes, right, in, in the spaces in which we all operate, um, especially as it pertains to some of the more uh, remote communities, marginalized ones, especially that women and, and others might be involved in. Um, and that's really the opportunity to make sure that their data is represented in these uh, larger models uh, that might inform policy and research and, and extension. I think the thing we obviously need to be very careful about is there is, of course, personally identifiable information here, especially when it comes to ground truth information, uh, which could be obviously very sensitive from a privacy as well as a proprietary and, and even maybe national security type of points of view. Um, and that's where data governance uh, is really critical. Uh, so it's, it's open data, uh, but that doesn't mean that everyone has access to every piece of everyone's raw data. It's about thinking of what data is useful to whom um, in, in formats that, that respect individuals' interests. Yeah, that, that's such a good, I was actually my next question. So, <laughs> so thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, data governance is, is so important. And, and um, yeah, I would love to know a, a bit more about how did you sort of navigate that with such, you know, different types of partners? I mean, were there any challenges for bringing different partners together? How did you uh, set the parameters, you know, as, as, as far as data governance goes? Yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Yeah, it's, it's still obviously early days for, for most of the communities that we work with to really understand the value of their own data. Just as somebody in the comments mentioned, you know, there's even issues of just basic literacy, uh, let alone tech and, and data literacy. Uh, and that goes not just for the farmers, but even for our, our government extension uh, partners, they too are building their capacity on, on some of the things that Maida talked about, like fair principles and stuff, uh, which is really important. 
uh, but that that in uh, that capacity is not 100% there. And so we need to be proactive about ensuring that their interests are are protected. And, and that's the reason why we're working on uh, software solutions like FarmStack that, that you mentioned um, as a way for organizations and individuals to codify their various types of data protection requirements and usage policies, whether that is just a basic consent to say that, yeah, I'm willing to share this data with this or that organization, but maybe also more sophisticated types of usage policies to say, hey, I'm willing to share my data with CropWatch because they're gonna uh, make these yield estimations which can inform extension in my own uh, productivity decisions. Uh, but I might not be willing to, to have it just exposed, let's just say on the broader Guardian public platform, for instance. Um, and so allowing for that kind of flexibility, um, I think is, is and, and basically the control of the data owner, uh, we believe is, is really critical. And, and this is a time that we have to be proactive about doing it, even though this literacy is yet to develop. I think as a, as a community, we really need to make sure that that's done um, preemptively to ensure that there isn't like exploitation or, or uses that were uh, uh, bad intentioned uh, that could take place. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, so this is actually that kind of uh, uh, also fits the poll result <laughs> because uh, I mean, when you think about progress and innovation in terms of um, data sharing, it's not just about new technologies um, that can come up, but also progress and innovation in terms of data management and um, being sure that those, um, uh, you know, we have that infrastructure in place to protect uh, sensitive data and, and to better allow for um, collaboration between different types of organizations as well. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, if, if there's any questions um, for Rickin, please feel free to put them into the chat. I'm going to pull a few more um, and from the previous panels, um, from the previous sessions here. So I've got a question here from Cheryl Porter uh, for a question from Meta and Rickin. Um, she says, we need more automated ways of describing legacy data, which were not collected with standard vocabularies. So how can we better make use of new technologies such as natural language processing and other AI methods to um, semantically link data available in Guardian datasets with text-based documents that describe these experimental or survey data? Great question, Cheryl. <laughs> hey, Cheryl, good to see you or hear your question. <laughs> um, so that's a great question indeed. And one of the things that we're, we're trying to figure out is, um, I should mention, we, we're also working with, with Cheryl on, on trying to kind of get to a, a better uh, fair workflow. That's, that's one of the things that uh, we're evaluating with them. But, but the, the flip side of that fair workflow is, can we get to a point uh, where, where humans don't have to sit there and, you know, da -da 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 for every, every data set, particularly for legacy data? Um, as we move forward, I'm hoping that we can actually collect data that's born fair much more. Um, but, but what do we do with, with, you know, the tons of data that's sitting there, much of which or, you know, a lot of which could be high value data. Um, first of all, we need to identify it, what, what might be high value and prioritize that. But then it would be really nice to, to, to throw it into some sort of, let's say, black box and what comes out of it is much fairer data that then, you know, might require human eyes, should probably require human eyes. Uh, on it, but a lot of the, the grunt work is already done. Um, so I've been discussing with our Guardian developers a, a way to do that, um, at least to, to take the steps towards doing that um, by using, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a core set of uh, data variables and then pre-mapping to, to things like the ontologies, but also the ECASA variables that you guys work on, Cheryl. Um, and then be able to sort of train our, our, our workflow to automatically, you know, so when you have a data set, it automatically annotates um, uh, data. And, you know, to start with maybe one at a time, but I, the idea would be to, to sort of process a large number of data sets this way. Um, and then have the human being look at those data and, and um, you know, be able to say, yes, I agree with this or no, you know, I want to tweak this. Um, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but but that is um, sort of something that we've we've thought about and are kind of working towards. 
um, kind of in the in the context of the agrofin stuff. It's it's related, but you know it's a long story. Um, but but we're getting there. Rickon, I don't know you you may have much more intelligent things to say about this. <laughs> no, I, I think that those are good. And I, I'd say the only thing I'd also add is a lot of the types of partners that we work with more on the ground, uh, they typically don't have very sophisticated uh, relational database structures. Most yeah. of the time they're just passing around individual uh, Excel or CSV files of soil information or extension interventions. And, and I think even that first step <laughs> of uh, basically uh, parsing some of that data into uh, key data types and and exposing uh, certain types of uh, APIs and maybe usage policies around them with, with certain metadata that they might be willing to share is a very important <laughs> first step uh, before uh, some of these more complex uh, kind of elements of um, you know, ontological semantic relationships um, can then be explored. But, but step one is I think we need to uh, just expose some of this data, of course, in a way that protects our individual interests, but, but shared in a way that is structured uh, so that the exploration of them can begin. Thank you, uh, Rikin and, and Meta for that, that great answer. Um, so we've, we've gone quite far <laughs> over time. So we're going to wrap it up uh, now. Um, first of all, um, uh, before we do that, Andy's going to uh, talk very briefly about a competition that is well, it's geared towards Alliance uh, researchers, but it is also still quite interesting to look at um, the possibilities that are there for uh, using others' data. This was a question that came up before about how to use others' data. So um, before we do that, I'm also going to launch the final poll. Um, which is, you know, we want to we want to just sort of check back in with you <laughs> on whether uh, any of your ideas on on um, uh, data sharing has changed after this panel. So feel free to answer while uh, Andy talks about this about this competition. Okay. Oh, no, thanks. Uh, that was that was a great conversation. Really enriching. Great presentation. Loved it. Um, I was, I was playing around with CropWatch just as, as, as Rickon was talking. Um, so, um, you know, when, uh, for 10 years now, since we've been kind of developing, uh, you know, working on this kind of open access, open data stuff, from the start, we, we had this idea really of, uh, you really need three, from an institutional perspective, you need to work hard on three fr fronts, right? You know, one is having the systems in place to be able to share data right and that's getting easier and easier and there's getting you know we saw amazing examples there from 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 meta of some of the kind of the stuff that, that that's being done um you know the the systems that facilitate it make it easy right but then you need the capacity it's the human element right you can have the best systems in the world but if people don't know how they work and how to do it then 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 you're in a mess so we've got to work on the capacity and then the third is the culture right and and i think the polls for me are showing so that's where we've still got to work hard is on the culture, right? And um, it's not just rec the culture of recognizing the importance of open data, but it's it's creating a culture of recognition and incentives, right? And so you look at where basically we're doing worse, it's that. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, that's that's that for me is the, the key message coming out from these polls is, you know, that is the, that's the stumbling block these days. You know, 10 years ago, it was systems and capacity, you know, really now, Big time, it's this culture. So, um, so something to look out for for my alliance colleagues uh, on the call here. We'll we'll do a little little prize, the symbiosis prize, right? And so, open data is about symbiosis, right? It's it's providing and taking, right? And so, we're going to have the the symbiont and the parasite awards for um, for for best practice in open data. Um, so, who? The, the, the symbionts are the ones that are providing the most amazing data resources and the parasites, the one that are, that are mining using secondary data and doing amazing things. So um, this will be, uh, we'll set up this prize. We'll be getting a, an email shortly from um, probably next week from uh, Leroy launching this. Um, and um, this this will be our little, little effort at least institutionally to help create a little bit more incentives and create some recognition around um, around this. Back to you, Marion. Thank you so much. Before we wrap, 
I would love to just ask all the panelists a question. And, and that is, if you had your dream data dump, like World Klim, <laughs> what data would that be from, from which organization or, or whatever and, and why? So I don't know if Andy, you wanna, you're welcome to start first. Oh man, you put me on the on the spot. I, I uh, does anyone else have one? Wait a anyone else can jump in if you if you have something already. Maybe there's someone who who could be on this webinar listening who has the data that you want. So you know you can speak directly to them. You know, Marianne, I, this is oops, sorry, this is Nina. Okay. Um, but 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 I think it's not to me. It's never about one data set or one data type. It's always about the ability to to look across different kinds of data, because when we, particularly at CGIR, but in agriculture in general, we're talking about you know genetics, so so breeding type of data. We're talking about uh, management type of data. We're talking about environmental biophysical kind of data, and we're talking about socioeconomic data. You know, the famous G by E by M by S um, uh, types of data. How do we operate across them? I mean, the the typically we're not driven by the data. We're driven by a question, and 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 that's how it should be, and I could will continue to be. But then, you know, being able to easily work across the, the data stream, I think is very critical. So I, I guess I would turn that that around and say, you know, maybe there's somebody out there who says, this is the data set that, that is of critical importance to me. That certainly is true. But when I think of it for myself, uh, it's not so much about a data set or a type of data set. It's about the ability to quickly, agilely uh, leverage data and, 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 and get some actionable things out of it make recommendations, you know, for, for our key stakeholders. That's a, that's I agree with that, but let great, me, I, I, I've answer. got, I've got a couple now, you know, I mean, for me, <laughs> and it's not so much research data, right, but like volumes of sales of specific fruits, vegetables, crops, you know, uh, food, basically, right, disaggregated, but it's kind of basically that market data, just to understand consumption and availability and prices, you know, that, the, for me, the big thing we have in the food system, the big blind spot is so much of the, 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 the food flows that are going on. And so that, I'd like that one. And I also, I, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll also request like, I mean, I just think cell phone data, like if we could have access to, easy access to some cell phone data that is fully anonymized, completely, you know, basically covering for any kind of risks in terms of, um, in terms of uh, privacy and things like that. But I think, you know, even at a basic level, that kind of stuff is really critical for understanding all sorts of things, migration, movement of people, movement of goods, services, things like that. So there you go, there, I, I, two for the price of one for me. Thank you, Andy. Any, any last, last minute additions to that question? I mean, I guess from our side, it, it would be like the reverse, <laughs> kind of like to say, like from the farmer perspective, to have data around how, how farmers don't just get like prescriptions of like this or that recommendation, but like can weigh trade offs on their own, uh, in their own conditions, and, and just make better decisions in a way that they can trust. It, it, that that to us is like most critical and, and too often it's a fact sheet or a video that's just telling them do x and <laughs> not enough of like let me help help me weigh cost benefit trade-offs of things i might want to uh, optimize for whether that's water or maximizing uh revenue or reducing costs like that doesn't exist even with all the research that is taking place <laughs> thank you rickin that's excellent um, well, if there's no uh, last minute additions, we have the, the results of the poll. So <laughs> we have uh, over 50% of those who participated in the poll have, have said that um, after watching this webinar, the likelihood of, of them sharing data is 100%. So, so that's great. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, that's a great result. So we really hope that, um, that uh, you all have learned something um, useful and also uh, just 
just found this to be very interesting um and yeah that you think about sharing your data moving forward so thank you so much um panelists before you leave one thing that we do like to do um is to take a quick screenshot so that we can um post on twitter and social media um so i'm just going to to do that now a question just come on, come in about the recording of the webinar. Um, yes, absolutely. You can find it on the Big Data web uh, website and on the YouTube channel. We'll be posting that probably, uh, well, yes, absolutely next week, um, seeing as this week is, is already finishing. Um, so yes, you'll definitely find that recording um, available. So uh, we'll just... Make quick, quick screenshots. So if you guys can smile, <laughs> if you want, you can give a little wave. And uh, to our panelists, thank you so much. To our audience members, thank you so much again. And we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. See you. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.